going to the Zoom room now where we have Education Superintendent John Fernandez uh, standing by. Good morning, John. Hey, good morning, Chris and Sabrina and uh, Jason. Hope you guys are doing okay this week. We're doing pretty good. I guess uh, we'll just first start. What I had a question was um, with the anticipated uh, announcement of a return to pandemic condition of readiness three this week. <laughs> how would that uh, affect the operations of uh, the Department <coughs> of Education? Well, you know, I, I think, um, you know, definitely will be, um, it'll be relevant to our discussions, but I, mean, I think there's nothing that I don't think we will be able to do immediately with regard to our operations, uh, just because we're going to PCOR 3, because under PCOR 3, I still believe we're going to have to continue to, uh, you know, keep the safety uh, parameters in place at school. And um, those are really the, the defining factors for how we operate, you know, the, the mass, the distancing and so forth. Uh, we are in a discussion about um, face-to-face and, um, you know, the potential expansion of face-to-face. So when I looked at our numbers the other day, we have about 7,800 students who are uh, currently enrolled in face-to-face. Uh, at this point, we only have a, have a, um, waiting list of about 250 students that we're going to work with the schools on to see if they can go ahead and be um, addressed or accommodated uh, in, in the face-to-face uh, model. The, the challenge is we have about 14,000 uh, total spots uh, you know, available in terms of capacity for face-to-face right now. And because we're giving parents the option, uh, what that shows me is that we, we don't have an overwhelming demand uh, for you know, parents at this point to to want to send their kids um, to, to school right away. I mean, going back to face to face, maybe PCOR three uh, will um, you know encourage families to you know, maybe make that decision. Uh, we're going to probably go out and and, and uh, you know discuss um, you know how to uh, have that conversation with our community. Let them know that you know if they're interested, you know please let us know so we can at least if we can't uh, accept you today, we can at least get you on the waiting list. And help track those numbers, and those numbers will help give us a, a sense of how um, of the demand, I guess, uh, to come back. So, so right now, again, you know, if, if there are families who are interested uh, in coming back to face to face, they need to let the schools know to see if they can be accommodated or at least put on the wait list. So, when when we make the decision to expand, we can at least uh, have that information available and uh, try to accommodate that. So I guess, you know, what that tells us is that, you know, the families are still kind of weighing their options. Uh, GDOE hasn't, you know, made it um, uh, mandatory to come back or to choose any of the models of learning. So at this particular point, we have 7,800. I'm just going to give you rough numbers. It doesn't account for all of the students, but uh, 7,800 students uh, on, uh, um, face-to-face. We have about uh, over 10,000 students who are online and I believe close to 8,000 students who are in hard copy. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be reconciling those numbers just to make, you know, and track those numbers as we go forward, as we go along because of the, you know, the, the hopes that we can expand face to face. But that really gives us a sense of uh, where people are in terms of their preferences. Um, you know, again, you know, on February 22nd, we will get the, um, the, the bids from vendors for the um, path, the uh, internet, uh, the home internet uh, services, and we're going to hope to be able to push those services out, you know, shortly thereafter. And so as, as we start to get internet access support at home, uh, we definitely have laptops that are available to provide the students. We are going to make a hard push uh, for students to, to uh, get online if they're not comfortable going face to face, because we recognize that um, down the road, you know, we think the hard copy option is going to be hard to sustain at the same time that we're trying to uh, expand face-to-face instruction in school and to add more days. So that's kind of the long-term thinking. But for now, you know, what we'll do is once we get to PCOR 3, uh, we, we are, you know, scheduling a briefing for the board uh, to go over the current numbers and to uh, have some discussion about what those next steps might be to, um, you know, to get more students uh, back into school. Um, and, and, and which I think is what we want to see. I, I, I would say that, uh, you know, also critical to that decision is the fact that uh, we want to see as many of our employees who uh, took the option to get vaccinated receive the second dose. And so that window of time for the second dose, actually, um, for those who got their dose at, at the, on the 
20th, uh, their uh, first date, you know, given the guidance of four days before, four days after, is actually starts today and then runs through the end of uh, February, basically, because we ran several days of vaccinations. So what we're going to be doing for all of our employees who received their first dose is uh, we're coordinating with the guard to send all of those employees down to UOG uh, using their, their system and uh, the number of days that they have available to support the second doses uh, for the, the GDOE employees. Um, and I think that'll help a lot of uh, our employees feel more very you know, much more comfortable uh, expanding the numbers. For the 250 you said were on the waiting list uh, currently for face-to-face, what, what do they need to do? They just call the principal and then they're, they're in? Um, they can start like well right now it. no we're, we're really looking at the we're going to be looking at those numbers because even though we have capacity uh the reason why students might be on wait list is because um at that grade level they might be full versus mm-hmm. you know uh, having space in other in other uh, grade levels so we want to go look into those situations and make sure uh, we understand that because that would be pretty much um you know one of the issues that would prevent students from immediately being able to go back so if you're going, if you're, you know, going to, you know, applying at an elementary school, and uh, you're in a, you're in the third grade class, but that's full, even though fourth grade and fifth grade have room, uh, you still might be put on the, you still would be put on the waiting list until there's a uh, space uh, to be able to accept you. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I understand that there's a, a IEP uh, meetings coming up. Is that correct? Um, well, there's a, a couple of things coming up. So, oh, mm-hmm. if, let me go back real quick on the PCOR 3 okay. uh, issue. There is one item that we've asked uh, for uh, a potential decision um, from the governor, and that is a you know, decision on interscholastic sports mm-hmm. for the high schools. So right now we have authorization to begin pro- you know, practices and so forth, and we submitted our guidelines to, uh, uh, to the governor's office of public health um, these are the guidelines with all the safety you know, precautions and, and uh, practices that we would take. And uh, as part of that, you know, we're looking at, at, at starting up a, a season of low risk sports, including um, cross country, tennis, uh, boys and girls volleyball, and then potentially a second season of moderate risk sports, uh, which would include, uh, you know, basketball um, and other uh, similar sports. I think the only sports we're not doing is our rugby wrestling and football. So with that, we put that proposal forward. I think the, uh, these, uh, I guess the proposed start of competition is actually March 1st, based on the planning that has been done by our uh, coaches and athletic directors. Uh, but we told the Lieutenant Governor yesterday that, you know, let us, you know, please let us know because we can't flip the switch on right away. Uh, I mean, just on you know, the day after we need, we still need that lead time to, to lock and finalize everything that we need to finalize. So we're hoping that when they get to PCOR 3 and that declaration, uh, there might be some guidance on uh, on sports. Uh, can I, I, I think, Sabrina, you asked about IEP meetings. I'm not sure what you're referring to exactly, but I did want to use that opportunity because um, I know we do have a, you know, a special education training going on for parents. Um, and I'm not sure that's focused on the IEP. But, yeah, that, that's uh, what we meant. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I know there was some concern about, I mean, there's, you know, there's been some concerns in some of the media when, when they talk to parents about special education and, um, and the services that are being provided. And, I, and admittedly, uh, especially when we were in uh, the full, um, kind of full lockdown, there was no face-to-face instruction, it was very difficult to, um, you know, to provide services to our students. Basically, students and their, you know, and families were uh, operating under what they're under what we are calling interim, you know, IEPs, basically to cover the the uh, period of time where students are not able to go to come to school. Now that we're open to face to face, you know, for face to face instruction, we do have uh, students, um, many of our students who've opted to come in to, um, you know, to for face to face instruction and to be able to come in and receive services at school. So that has helped. Uh, the population of students uh, who've chosen that option. And actually, in some cases, uh, based on their IEPs, they're able to come, uh, you know, for for all days that are available during the week. So that's helpful. Now, there's still a large population of students, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, who are still opting to to remain at home. And while they are at home, again, it it is still difficult to uh, provide 
some of the services that are only available you know, coming to school. So they are still able to take advantage of some of the telehealth, teletherapy uh, types of supports, uh, able to, to, to take advantage of the online you know, platform. Um, if they're enrolled in hard copy, again, there are some challenges there that we see for all students, uh, but you know, especially those um, who may need that extra support. Um, hopefully, you know, in the future in the classroom to get that support. And that includes the support of one-to-one -one aids. I know that's been a, a topic of many parents. Can we, um, you know, can the aides come to the home? Uh, can they help, you know, provide services to our kids, uh, you know, where we live? And that's really not, uh, uh, you know, able to be supported. I mean, there are just so many, you know, challenges and risks and liabilities that are involved with having an employee, um, you know, operating within somebody's private residence. So that's something we've been, in, you know, discussing with parents. But um, at this point, the goal is to get them back into school. Right. Yeah, I was referring to the, um, it says preparing your child's IEP meeting uh, sessions will provide you with tips for a successful IEP meeting. Uh, sessions are Wednesday, February 24th, uh, 530 to 7 p.m. Saturday, March 6, 20 to 21. Uh, I'm sorry, March 6, 2021, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And uh, today well, is the deadline the, to register. I think yeah, it's with I know Cedars. the Education Division has offered a, a, you know, a numerous um, uh, sessions, all virtual, you know, right. at this point for, for parents. And we've, uh, we've been urging them to continue to do so. Uh, again, the challenge is the, challenge is the IEPs are yeah, absolutely you know, critical for determining and agreeing upon the services that every uh, student in, you know, in special education uh, is able to receive. And that IEP is, you know, forms the basis of our obligation to those students. The challenge is um, under the current circumstances, if, you, um, if you're not at school, there are limited, you know, the, the services available are not as, um, you know, as they're, they're not as available if your student remains at home. So again, if in your IEP, you request the support of a one-to-one -one aid, uh, that one-to-one -one aid would be available to you at school. Um, if, you're, if you're requesting services or related services, uh, such as physical therapy or occupational therapy, those, you know, of course, are also available, but not at your home. So there are a lot of um, you know there are a lot of um, uh, challenges there, but if you do uh, you know uh, come back to school, your IEP is the plan. It's the basis of our obligation, and parents and students have rights uh, that they can assert to ensure that those services are delivered. Mm -hmm. So again, you know we want our schools to be safe. We want to improve the safety you know, the environment at our schools. We want the community to be safe so that we can welcome all students uh, back. And I think and again because we've given parents. The, the option of choosing, um, you know, we know that there are parents who say, well, I'm not really comfortable yet with my student going back due to their health, you know, medical situation and so forth. Um, and, but that's really, a, you know, part of the uh, challenge that we have to deal with because until they get to school, uh, some of the services will not be available. What's been the um, turnout, the feedback on the, the learning resource centers? Uh, well, you know, I'm trying to gather the information. We only basically had a couple of days mm -hmm. uh, last week. And so um, I just, this morning, I was trying to get an update. So tomorrow I'll get a better sense of, um, of the um, number of, you know, of um, students who were able to access the, the learning centers. Uh, in my estimation, I think we, we got to do a, you know, more of a you know, marketing job to ensure that um, the kids and the parents know that the sessions are available and start to uh, start to schedule those planned workshops that we um, you know have laid out. So I think we opened the first round and we, we, we kind of did it as a soft opening. We didn't really make a hard push because we wanted to make sure everything was in place, all the staffing details and so forth were worked out. So uh, we do have a lot of posters being developed and, and uh, things for social media being developed so that we can push, push that out to all of our families. Um, I think one of the, you know, the questions that we get are, you know, let's, let's just say we open a center at CL Titano. Um, I know that there are uh, parents that I've heard that who are asking, is that only for their students? And the answer is no. The answer is if you are a student, private school student, charter school student, uh, public school student, even if you don't go to CL Titano, you are still able uh, to go to that learning center. So some of, those, some of that information still needs to get out into the community. And uh, otherwise, you know, I think, uh, I think the uh, assumption is that it's only for the students of that school, 
Um, but again, you know, it, it is wide open for any student who lives in that area to be able to um, to go to uh, those learning centers nearby and be able to use the computers and to um, access the internet. We do have staff there who will be supervising and ensuring, you know, that that everything is, um, you know, orderly and safe, you know, at the site. So that'll be our continued uh, uh, focus. We did meet with the mayors, we, uh, with a couple of mayors, and uh, we are scheduled for their next mayor's meeting because I think the other uh, side of the equation is that we do know that there are families in need of the support. And we do know that there are groups and organizations that work with children that uh, could use the space as well. And so uh, we, we had a preliminary conversation uh, with Mayor Hoffman, uh, Mayor Sabaris, as well as um, uh, Mayor Alec, uh, who is the, the, the chair of the Mayor's Council of Guam. And we'll be meeting uh, with the Mayor's Council in, 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 uh, as a group to uh, give them the updated information and to uh, let them know that you know they're able to to work with, we we want to work with them and partner with them to make sure that uh, they're able to use the uh, learning centers for community needs so that's uh, something that we know will be um, uh, very welcome at least in our initial conversations very welcome uh, by the mayors uh, to support not just the, the the access to technology but we are talking about the after school programs the summer programs Things that the mayors are always trying to you know to do to keep the kids occupied, right. uh, we think we can really partner uh, with the mayors to make our facilities available and uh, support the academic enrichment and uh, and some of the you know the catching up that needs to happen over the summer. John, we had a question in our comments. Uh, being PCOR three, uh, will the traditional graduation ceremony at UOG be, be considered for or any of the schools uh, be considered for twenty twenty one seniors? So right now, my understanding is that the again, we, you know, we, we aren't in PCOR three yet, and don't I don't have all the details on on what the guidance will be, but um, the, the because of the fact that we're in February and we need to plan for any, you know, plan uh, for any uh, occasion uh, or any uh, you know circumstance, the um, the the high schools have already um, you know with their senior classes. Um, voted on having gradding, you know, the uh, grad and go uh, ceremonies this year. So, uh, you know, part of that, of course, has to do with the fact that, um, you know, the time to plan and to pull everything together for a traditional graduation is very short. Um, the opportunities to raise funds to support those graduation ceremonies and all of the events alongside them um, has been very limited. And so, I, I guess, in anticipation or of not of, of having to make those. You know decisions and get the planning underway for the ceremonies the uh six high schools have opted for uh, graduate the um, grad and go ceremony similar to what they did last year i think this time they'll be able to you know i think enhance what they did um you know some of the schools last year as you know had stages you know did all of the um the you know just the live streaming uh set up places for photos and, and, and so forth and they did that at the very almost at the very last second so i think what they wanted to do was give themselves more than you know a, a couple of weeks to make those adjustments get those um, uh, arrangements in order and if they're going to do those graduate you know, the grad and go uh, ceremonies to be able to enhance it and uh, do much more and be much more creative than they were able to be last year so um that's the uh, we have the dates actually tentatively set up which we shared with the board and I will probably be will uh, soon push out to the general public, uh, you know, when they're um, when we're ready to do that. Anything else from your your meeting yeah, with the just, lieutenant governor? Uh, well, if I could offer, you know, we you know we're in the midst of trying to uh, you know get a proposal together for the use of the hundred and ten million dollars that that GDOE is getting as part of the um, or, you know I don't know if you call it CARES two or the Education Stabilization Fund Part two. Uh, we got forty two million you know, in, in phase one, phase two is 110 million. And as part of our outreach, uh, we do, uh, we are holding two uh, sessions with our uh, PTO leadership across the island. And that starts today. So today, um, Wednesday, um, February 17th from four to 5.30, uh, we will be online Facebook Live uh, with our elementary, uh, elementary school uh, parent leadership groups. That's from four to 5.30. And then from 6 to 7.30 uh, this evening, we will be with our secondary. So that's middle school and high school. Uh, so that's uh, those discussions. We will be getting parent input 
into the types of supports and issues that they want to see addressed with this round of funding. Uh, tomorrow, similarly, uh, from 6 to 7.30, we are going to have a session with special education uh, parents. Um, so, you know, we welcome, um, we welcome the, um, the interest and the uh, participation. Uh, we will be uh, tracking it on Facebook Live, um, tracking questions and comments so that we can answer it in the session. And uh, we will use that as part of our community input uh, to be able to finalize the proposals to USDOE by the end of the month. Okay. Uh, anything else from uh, your meeting with the Lieutenant Governor yesterday? Um, well, you know, he did indicate that PCOR 3 was possible. So, you know, again, I think our, our focus was, you know, number one, help us get, you know, help ensure that we get the vaccinations done for our employees. Um, number two, we asked him to, to see if we could get the governor to you know, give us a decision on interscholastic sports. Uh, we do want to finalize an MOU with public health to really kind of nail down uh, the relationship that we have uh, relative to immunization, vaccinations, testing, because under PCOR 3 and going forward, we still know that um, that we're going to, to need to um, you know, continue to partner with public health as part of the community you know, strategy. Um, we also, in talking with him about the use of funds, especially on his side, uh, we are talking about uh, supporting uh, at least uh, a first phase of school-based health services as part of our community strategy to, um, you know, again, to test and to um, uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19. We have been talking long-term about school-based health services, uh, meaning that kids are at school, families come to school, it's a, it's a hub in the community. What are some of the basic services that we might be able to provide to our school nurses, uh, to those, you know, to those families, whether they be on weekends uh, or after school. And so, uh, you know, we've been talking about that, about the opportunity to also support that with Medicaid funding. And um, I think the fact that we're now in COVID-19, this pandemic situation, I, I, I think underscores the need for that type of uh, community-based uh, healthcare that will basically support public health in its efforts, you know, around the island by having uh, the services delivered where the kids are. So things like immunizations, things like uh, conducting physical exams that are required for the students to, you know, to, to be in school, all those types of things can be done uh, and offered at the school level if we uh, do this correctly. So, uh, you know, I think that's part of uh, uh, something that I think will uh, hopefully shape and uh, be able to propose as part of this round of funding. Just for clarification, those, those uh, cl clinics that you're talking about, it's just for GDOE students? Um, at, at this point, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't think it would be limited at this point, but we're mm -hmm. still designing, designing it. I, I think it is based on the fact that we know we have a high concentration of students and a high concentration of families that are in our schools. Uh, I would venture to guess that a lot of them are going to be uh, eligible for uh, some type of public assistance as well, or Medicaid, you know, or, or eligible for Medicaid services. And so I think that's the, that's the concept that we're starting with. Um, but but in terms of who is able to get those services, we haven't really worked out those details. Mm -hmm. I think right now we're right, we're really thinking about you know who would staff those services, yeah. what types of services would be offered, make sure that we're doing it under the authorization of public health, and then you know we can then uh, figure out um, how you know who who would uh, be eligible um, in terms of being able to come and take advantage of those services. Is there a ballpark so, figure of like how much that would uh, cost? Well, the, the governor has about 33 million, but I don't think it'll cost all that much. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's the same answer I get when people ask me, they, they say, well, you know, I say, how much is it going to cost? And they say, how much do you have? <laughs> so, uh, we have 10 million, but I hope it doesn't cost that much. Yeah. Um, just so you know, the, the funny thing about this is we are working very hard to figure out not just how we want to spend this, these funds, but making sure that we provide the necessary staffing to ensure the smooth expenditures of, of those funds. And at the same time, we're listening out because my understanding is that in the, you know, in, in Congress, uh, in this third package, there is about 130 billion uh, being set aside for K-12 education. 130 billion um, definitely uh, overshadows the 80 billion that we got this round, 80 billion translated into 110 million for GDOE, 
Uh, so you can just do the math, 130 billion is going to be, um, you know, another significant amount that'll be on top of what we've already received. So we are really, um, you know, thinking mid medium term, long term, in terms of how we get our kids back into school. With all these, these, these funds, we should be able to, you know, hopefully create, maintain and sustain a safe environment, you know, as we, as we exit this pandemic. So that's our hope and that's our challenge. You got a big uh, hearing next week, I understand, before yes, uh, uh, Speaker, I'm uh, not Speaker, uh, Senator Tolina. Yes, yeah, so, so that'll be our first opportunity. Uh, I mean, the, the topics, there are numerous topics, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, first first is uh, our FY22 budget request. Um, second, I believe, is, you know, focus on the CARES Act funding and uh, getting an update on and progress report on that. And then I know there were questions about uh, some of the unaccounted for students as well as uh, special education. So uh, we'll, we'll hope to uh, be able to address those questions and her concerns or any ideas that they might have to offer um, next week. Uh, she has given us um, some early, you know, an early opportunity to provide that information. So we actually have that information and are providing it to her in advance of the hearing. Um, so uh, hopefully it'll be an opportunity to, to kind of focus in on uh, areas that, uh, you know, that are uh, of importance to the legislature. Anything else? Uh, no, as you can tell, my voice is kind of cracking. I've been <laughs> trying to get through the had a board meeting last night. You know, there's tons of meetings, Zoom, you know, Zoom meetings, and so it really tests the voice. So hopefully next week I'll be back to normal. But uh, thank you for bearing with me today. Wait, you said there's a board meeting. Anything uh, significant from the board meeting? Any motions, amendments? Oh yeah, and well, well the board. You know, the board. We have a new board. We have a new chairman and vice chair. Um, we, with, with uh, Chairman Mark Mendiola and our Vice Chair, Dr. Mary Okada. So, uh, you know, basically what uh, we've done over the past month is reorganize the board, the board committees, and are kind of focusing in on some of the key areas that are going to really demand their attention and we're going to really need their, their leadership and participation. And so, in, in general, uh, what I've told them is, that, you know, number one, COVID-19 recovery is going to be the top topic of the year. Let's make sure we you know, we are meeting and updating and you know, working together to ensure that we get our kids back to school and do so safely for both our, our kids and our employees. Uh, another major area is going to be facilities. And so uh, facilities, we have a master facilities plan underway and I need to brief the board and then uh, brief the, you know, our governor and uh, legislature uh, because we want their participation in this facilities planning um, as, and so that we can um, start to tackle some of these key school facility issues that we know have been out there for a while. Um, but we do need a strategy to start funding them. And so we're, we're, we're going to be uh, having, you know, getting that plan done this year. And we're hopeful that we'll get support and identify some opportunities to fund those, you know, those projects once that plan is completed. And then the third major area is has to do with strategic planning, uh, because this is the year where we need to update our strategic plan. So we do have, um, you know, this plan is not just for, for, for fun. It, it's, you know, it's to help guide us, you know, through the next five years, but definitely needs to be adjusted to reflect everything that we've come through during COVID-19. And uh, we use this, we use this plan to basically help guide the federal investments. Now, when we work with USDOE, they want to see our plan. They want to see an alignment of the funding to the plan. So that's also important that we get that done. So uh, this was our uh, opportunity with the board to shore up the, their team, the committee structures, and uh, we're going to be getting to work this month on, uh, you know, getting them involved and uh, help uh, drive some of those initiatives. So, uh, so we're looking forward to that. All right. Thanks. Thanks, John. Yeah, John. All right. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate okay. it. See you. Okay, there you go. Uh, Eight forty-nine. Good morning. <laughs> Always lots of information from John. <laughs> I tell you, you don't even. All you hear is breeze pen. <laughs> and just a reminder, he did say that they're having the PTO uh, uh, meetings uh, today. It's going to be carried live on Facebook. So if you want to join in on the discussion, uh, post your questions. But it's at 4 to 530. I believe he said that was for the elementary. And uh, then there's another one uh, from 6 to 730 p.m. Again, these are going to be streaming on GDOE's Facebook page today. All right.